Thanks for the smile, Dave. And it is indeed good to be home. I'm glad to see all you bright and shiny faces. People love to study prophecy. But the thing that I think really interests them about prophecy is the future. What's going to happen? When's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? And it's a complete fascination. If you can sort of, there's, the, there's sort of an idea that if I can just study this carefully enough, I can sort this out, and maybe I can figure out really when the Lord is going to come. Of course, we've long since learned better than that. The danger is that we will miss what prophecy is all about. I read somewhere a long time ago that the difference between prophecy and apocalyptic literature is that prophecy contains more moral teaching, while apocalyptic is about what will happen. In other words, it's revelatory of events that will take place at one time in the future. The latter part of Daniel, for example, is apocalyptic. It basically just reels off a set of events that are supposed to take place. The first half of Daniel is more prophetic and has a great deal to do with moral teachings, especially chapter 9. Now, what's odd is that the book of Revelation, the title in Greek is the Apocalypse, is the, is in, which means the revealing. The odd thing is that it is probably one of the greatest books of prophecy in the Bible, not merely apocalyptic, because it is loaded with moral teachings. The odd thing about Revelation, of course, is that it has probably the most obscure set of, of uh, revelations as such in the Bible. You read the title, Revelation. So you go charging off into the book, and you think, well, it's going to reveal a whole bunch of stuff. Well, if it does, it does a very good job of hiding it. Now, what got me thinking about this today was an item in Francis Schaeffer's book, A Christian Manifesto. Not long ago, in one of my messages that I put on the radio, I cited Bob Dylan's song, The Times They Are Changing. And I thought that it was oddly prophetic, that song, and actually reached down in very, very strong terms right now, today, 2005 and 2006. So here was Francis Schaeffer, though, talking about another one of Dylan's songs. It was a song from his album, Slow Train Coming, titled, When You Gonna Wake Up? I'd never heard the song. I was out of the country during Bob Dylan's ascendancy, and so it was a lot of his work I never heard. The song goes, Adulterers in churches and pornography in the schools. You got gangsters in power and lawbreakers making rules. When you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up and strengthen the things that remain? Now, when I read that last phrase, I suddenly realized that Bob Dylan read the Bible. That's an unusual expression, to strengthen the things that remain. And somehow or other that had sat in my mind for a long period of time. And whenever I read it in uh, Francis Schaeffer's book as one of Bob Dylan's lyrics, it made me interested in learning a little bit more about the man. I did learn he became a born-again Christian sometime in the 1970s. He was born... His last name was, I forget his first name, birth name, but he was, his, his surname was Zimmerman. And his grandparents were Jewish immigrants to the United States. But that title, When You're Going to Wake Up and Strengthen the, the Things That Remain, comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 3. It's the letter to the church at Sardis. In chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 1, it says, in the church, To the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Now, he will close this letter with the words, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches which means that this isn't written to one church. It's written to all of the churches. There's a theory, still held by quite a few people, I think, that the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are about seven successive eras 
in the history of the church from ancient times until today. The Ephesian letter goes to what would be perceived by this theory as the first era of the church of God. And if you go on the internet, you'll find quite a number of sites about this, and you'll find them that uh, will lay out for you the sequence. I've seen a book way back when that actually laid out the, uh, the timing of them, the approximate year whenever the church th theoretically made a transition from one era to another era. Now, it's an article of faith with a lot of people, but it just isn't so. It's a harmful dogma in that it prevents the churches from dealing with what they read here. When, if they have ears, they are supposed to. If you have ears, and you, most of you, everybody here I think has one on each side, you are supposed to listen to what the Spirit says to all of these churches and not <clears throat> just brush them off as though they didn't apply in some way to us. Now, most of the people who hold the theory of eras, the doctrine of eras, of the church, assume that they are the Philadelphia era of the church. I did come across one. It was a surprise to me that they declared themselves to be the Laodicean era, but they had repented already and were had their feet in the right path. Uh, why they have the Philadelphia era? Well, because the Philadelphia era of the church seems to get the best grade of all of the churches in this list, so naturally they say, well, we're Philadelphia and you are not to borrow a line from Chevy Chase. First, let me explain to you what I think these letters are actually about, and then we'll look at them in more detail. Revelation is a book that is replete with symbols. I mean, it is an account of a vision that John had, like a dream. And if it was a dream, it was a nightmare, because the things that he saw would stand anyone's hair on end, and I would think bring, bring somebody out of a sound sleep and a cold sweat you know, wondering where he had been. It's not a record of real-time, literal events in the future. And that's going, that statement right by itself is going to trouble a lot of people who hear this tape. I'm sorry, but it's not. It's a dream. And the things that he saw stand for real, literal, end-time events. But the things he saw are not themselves the events. Probably a simple illustration of this would be that someone once upon a time speculated that the locusts, and the guys with these locusts that had gold helmets on their head, that these were helicopters and men with uh, gold uh, crash helmets, and that John had never seen anything like this before, so he said they're locusts and they have gold crowns on their heads. I don't think so. I think he, what he saw was a kind of surreal locust, and he just described what he saw. Nearly everything, including the numbers in Revelation, are, are symbolic. In fact, there is really very little in Revelation that can be taken literally. The big, a big mis people make a big mistake when they think the 144,000 is a literal number of people who are going to be saved. It's not. It is a symbolic number, and the more you study it, the more you realize it has to be symbolic. It just simply won't work as a literal hard number. That being the case, why should we take the number seven, as in the seven churches of Asia in chapter 1, why should we take that number as literal any more than we would any of the rest of them? I think nearly everyone understands that the number seven in the Bible actually is symbolic of completeness, whole, uh, fullness, all of whatever it is we're talking about. Now, in Revelation 1, chapter 10, John says this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice like a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a linen, or sorry, with a golden girdle. Why seven? Why not eight? Why not six? Why not fifteen? And why only these churches? Were there no other churches that might have been addressed? Well, no, of course not. There were more churches even in Asia Minor, much less the rest of the world. 
There are two things to notice about this. One, the seven churches to whom these letters are addressed existed contemporaneously. In other words, they were on the ground at the same time in Asia Minor. They were contemporaries. Second, the number seven is universally recognized as a symbol of completeness, of perfection, of the whole. It leaves me with two ways to understand these letters. One, they were written to seven literal churches at the time on the ground in Turkey. Second, these seven churches are types of the entire church in that day, in all times, and particularly in the last days. So think about it this way. They are typical of the church of God at the end time before, the Jesus, before Jesus Christ returns. This is sharply underlined in every letter where, this, where the speaker says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And without being too facetious, I think he is telling us to reach up and check to see if we have ears. And if we do, we need to listen to what's being said here. With that in mind, let's read the letter to Sardis with our own church in mind. Under the church of the angel and um, the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. Now that statement all by itself should make us stop and think. Jesus writes to this church and says, I know your works. I know what you're doing. I know what you're not doing. I know what you ought to be doing. I know what you know you ought to be doing and aren't doing. I know all these things about your church. So think about that. I know that you have a name that you live, a reputation that you live. I also know that you're dead. The, the name on the sign outside is not enough. You've got to be more than that. Now, we have in this church a reputation for being a friendly church. Here's what we need to think about. How deep does that friendliness go? How far down does it root, reach? What kind of roots does it have? It creates good potlucks. It creates good fellowship right here on the Sabbath day when we all get together. What does it do for people who can't be here but would if they could? What does it do for people who, for whatever reason, could be here but don't want to be for reasons that are unknown to us? What does it say about this? Is our friendliness, our warmth, really based on a love for one another, a genuine love for one another, or is it based on good food and conversation? Because there is a difference between these. One thing that brought this to mind was a visit to a nursing home on the way home back from Little Rock last Sunday. You walk down the, high, the halls and see old people parked in wheelchairs in the hallway. Just parked. Somebody who said, I, uh, some great wisdom has decided for one reason or another they need to be out of their rooms, and so they've loaded them up in a wheelchair, wheeled them down the hall, hallway, put them over against the side where nobody will stumble over them, and just left them there. They're not standing there watching television. They're not sitting there talking to somebody. They are just parked in the hallway. I watched one old lady in a wheelchair who apparently couldn't manage the wheels. And so in order to get herself down the hallway, there was a railing, you know, like sort of a, a railing down the side of the hall, and she would put her hand on it and pull herself forward a few feet, kind of recover herself, reach out, and pull herself forward a few feet. We went on down the hallway to our visit and visited for quite some little time there. And while I was sitting in the room... Here she went, by the doorway. She would get to the open doorway where there was nothing to pull on, and then she would struggle with the wheel or whatever to get herself past the doorway and take herself on. A little while later, here she came, going the other way, up the hallway. Now, I don't have any idea where that poor lady was going. I just kind of think she must have been doing her laps. She must have been exercising herself. She must, who knows what she was doing? But she had to be somehow on the move, and there was nobody there to push her chair for her, and so she just struggled with what she had. 
You can look in the doors as you walk down the hallway and see them lying in their beds looking at the ceiling. And the dominant feeling I get with these people is that they're alone. And obviously there's nobody with them, but I mean more than just that there's no one with them. They are alone in the world. I don't, even, I don't care if a nursing home has a good staff. That's a very nice thing to have. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that the nursing home staff is attentive and takes good care of their people. The problem is, is, is that their people, their children, their grandchildren, their sisters, their brothers, their old friends, don't come by to see them anymore. And they're alone. And their minds are unstimulated. There is nothing. You know, you, 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 I sort of had this impressed upon my mind that uh, you'll find people oftentimes, well, well, I can't remember this or I can't remember that. And it dawned on me, the problem is a complete lack of stimulation. You've got to stimulate the mind. You've got to get something, something, some blood moving around, some action moving around, some electrical currents going up there, or else the whole thing slowly decays and rots away to nothing. And I'm not talking about Alzheimer's. I'm talking about neglect of people that should not be neglected. I don't know how many of you have loved ones in nursing homes, but this is something for you to think about, but it's also something for a church to think about. The last thing in the world we should ever have is one of us, and some of us are getting kind of old. I don't want to be too personal about this. But some of us are going to wind up in a nursing home one of these days. It would be awfully nice if our church came by to see us on a regular basis and helped us to get the stimulation that we need to keep our minds from rotting away while we yet live. The people who know and care about these people have got more important things to do, so they don't go. Then he says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Now, I think it's fair to say to the, all of you who are here today and those who will listen to me later in, in some church somewhere, I think it's fair to say that we have all lost a lot of stuff along the road to where we are today. We don't carry along with us everything we ever had. We've just lost a lot of things. And it's vain to think that we're ever going to be able to get them back. I listened to this song, an old song. It, it, it has always haunted me. It's a love song of sorts. It says, I don't know where we went wrong, but the feeling's gone, and I just can't get it back. And I'm afraid for us that there is that thing, the things that we have lost, that no matter how hard we try, we will never, ever get them back. So the Spirit warns us that there is still more to be lost there is more that is dying, and that we had better strengthen the things that remain. That's what that line in the song is about. Strengthen the remaining things that are dying, lest you lose them too. What might those things be that remain? Well, maybe we should take an inventory of what we have with a view to making it stronger to strengthen the things that remain. What do we got? What do we have that we can make stronger? What do we have that we can do more with than we are currently doing? Not worrying about what we don't have. Not looking over our, our shoulders at the things that we have lost. Things we're never going to get back, so why worry about them? I often try to recommend to young men who are trying to become public speakers to not worry about where their shortcomings are so much as making the things they're good at stronger. No, you know, basically, if all you ever do in life is work on your weak points, you will end up being at best mediocre. The things to spend your time on are your strong points, making them stronger, to strengthen the things that remain. What should we do? Well, the Spirit says, Remember how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If you therefore will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you won't have a clue. If you don't watch, don't stay on your toes, you don't strengthen the things that remain, I will blindside you in the end. 
You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Interesting statement, that. A few that have not defiled their garments. If you study the Bible, you take the concordance and run all that stuff down on garments and staining your garments and so forth. You'll find two things. One is that the staining of garments seems to imply morality, idolatry, and this kind of thing. It involves bad conduct that we might involve ourselves with. But there's another thing you will also find. And that is that there, there are those who will be in God's presence who have washed their garments white in the blood of the Lamb. And so it isn't just a matter of your own righteousness and keeping yourself straight, but there are times when you have to go to the Lamb and have those garments washed and clean. He that overcomes, I don't know if you know this or not, but this line repeated in all of these uh, different letters to the churches is the line from which I derive the expression, born to win. Because the one who overcomes is the winner. And I thought, that's three syllables, let's go for one syllable, let's go for win. The overcomer shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Marvelous scripture that, and I, it harkens back to something Jesus said. He that denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. He who will confess me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. So, being a servant of Christ, and being known to be, is important. Not hiding who we are, not hiding why we do the things we do, not telling the waiter in a restaurant, well, I'm allergic to pork. That's not true. Well, it may be, but it's not for, not for certainly not for me. The thing to tell them is, I'm sorry, I don't eat pork. You can say that, but don't lie. Actually, if you want to be honest, my faith does not allow me to eat pork. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, all in all, that's a pretty sobering letter if you finally, you know, get our, just kind of hit ourselves upside the head and say, wait a minute. That's to all the churches, not just for this one. This is not just for a church back then. It's not for a different era in church history. It's true of the church of God in some parts of it in all history, and perhaps of individuals in those churches. What else is there to be learned from these letters? Well, we've always down through time heard a lot about Philadelphia, because that's what we all think we'd like to think we are. And then we hear from preachers a lot about Laodicea, because they tell us that's what we are. What about Pergamos? Now, notice I'm avoiding the normal order of this because I don't even want to imply, suggest, or hint that these, there's some kind of an era thing at work here. What about Pergamos? Revelation 2, chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he that has the sharp sword with two edges. Now, that ought to get you up on your, you know, sitting up straight and paying attention, shouldn't it? Hey, hear me. I got a sharp sword, two-edged. What does it mean? Well, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, <clears throat> The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He might just as well have said, I've got the sharp two-edged sword, and I can cut right down inside of you and know precisely what you're thinking, what you're intending, what you're wanting, what you're lusting after, I know all that stuff. Ah, well now, here's someone we would do well to listen to. He said, there's no creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to him with whom we have to do. Have you ever prayed stark naked? I'm not going to be, just don't get personal or have a show of hands here maybe in the bathtub, and wondered what God thought about you praying naked. Well, you know, you, you could say, you know, I came naked out of my mother's womb, and here I am. This is, this is all there is to me, O oh Lord. Uh, what you see is what you get. It's a strangely vulnerable experience to pray naked. The message here is we are completely vulnerable open to inspection by the Word of God, no matter how buttoned up we think we are. 
You might want to, you know, make note of that, because no matter how buttoned up you are, you might just as well be naked when it comes to God and to His Word. We're completely vulnerable. Now, he goes on to say in Revelation, I know your works, and you dwell where Satan's seat is. You hold fast to my name. You have not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwells. Now, this, this part of the letter seems to be singularly aimed at the first century church in Pergamos. And so far, no one among us has died for the faith, but then we haven't, aren't finished yet. And up until they killed Antipas, nobody in that church had died for the faith. But now, someone had. And we certainly live where Satan dwells and works, don't we? I mean, you can't turn on your television set, you can't listen to your radio. I mean, the evidence of Satan's working in society where we live is plain enough for anybody to see, and we live in one of the better parts of the world. Our job is to hold fast his name, which means essentially his reputation, our identity with him, and the fact that we stand for him. It'd be good when the time comes if God says to this church, I know that you live in the midst of so much sin that it's almost indescribable, but you have held fast my name and has not, have not denied my faith even living next door to Satan. That's something to have God say about us. However, he goes on to say, Oh, however, I do have a few things against you. Because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. Now, one of Balaam's failings that got him to the situation was an over-dedication to money. But that doesn't seem to be the issue that, that this particular letter is raising. Here, it is a what reference to what Balaam did for his money. He told Balak to send his women among the Israelite men to seduce them. Now, this is interesting because what happened when Balak was brought down there, the ba he, he was, I mean, when Balaam was brought, he, Balak paid him to curse the Israelites. He got there, he said, he told him, before I come, I can't say anything God doesn't tell me I can say. So he got up there, looked out across Israel, and when time came to prophesy, he gave a prophesy that Balak did not want to hear at all. And the big frustrations began to arise, and all sorts of things. And he tried to curse him, couldn't do it. He came down there to curse him for Balak. Couldn't do it. God would not allow it. So what he did was, he said, look, the only way you're going to get these Israelites is through your women. Your women are going to have to go down into their camp, seduce their men into idolatry. God will turn his back on them, and he will curse them then. Now, so what he's telling this church is, you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, I don't know if we have to take this, that these people were inside the church. It's just you live in this city, and you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. In other words, people who are involved in idolatry. And all those, all those Greek cities across the, uh, the Asian Peninsula, uh, Asia Minor, all of them were shot through with idolatry, fornication. They had temple. They had temple prostitutes here and there. It was a you know very sex-based society in many ways. Now, so this reference here in this thing is that the fornication that was so much a way of life in that area was seducing people, and this I have against you. So I have to conclude from that that there was their own involvement somehow inside the church on this. Fornication today is a way of life in our society, and it's our children who are being carried away with it as much as anything. The trend may be moving the other way a little bit with the kids, but it's still shocking how far it has gone. And one of the things that is really disturbing is that there are churches who are willing to tolerate fornication and homosexuality as though it were no big deal. And the comparison with what he's saying here is inescapable. You get to the place, I have this against you, 
that you have come to the place to where you will tolerate fornication. You will tolerate homosexuality. That kind of behavior is not tolerable to me. So you have also have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, there is no agreement that I have been able to find in, on what the doctrines of the Nicolaitans were. There are at least two or three significant ones that are bandied about here and there in various publications, and then you'll get something different when you get to the commentaries or to the Bible dictionaries. So I don't really know what these people did, what their problem was. Then he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone, in the stone a name written which no man knows, save he that receives it. Now, we've gone through that. Let's take a look at the church at Ephesus. This is the first one listed, but I don't think we should take it as the first era of God's church at all. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, I, th I think this was written well after John. Wrote, I mean, sorry, Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians, but it's the same church. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience, I know how you cannot bear those who are evil, I know how you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You know, we might just qualify on this last, because a lot of us here have encountered the claim of one who claimed to be an apostle, have tried it, and have concluded, no, he was not. So we might be able to say, we've lived up on that particular item. You have borne, you have patience. For my name's sake you have worked and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. That initial enthusiasm, excitement. And I would say you, all, you can make, make the rounds of just about any church anywhere, anytime, and say this to them, and they would all have to have guilty expressions on their faces and say, yeah, I don't feel the same way I did when I was in the flush of my first love. You know, I don't know that we can retain that. I really don't. And yet, we seem to be expected to. And if we have kind of let it get away from us, we're supposed to go back looking for it again. What was, relative to God and the faith, what was what were what were the defining characteristics of your first love? Was it the excitement with Bible study? Was it the excitement with the new stuff you were finding? Was it an excitement of sharing it with somebody you thought might want to know what you have just found out? You know, I can hearken back to the excitement that Allie's brother you know, Horace had about the Bible when he first visited us in our home, and we got we would stay up until 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning talking about the Bible. It was exciting. It was exciting to him. It was exciting to me. It was a time of great enthusiasm in Bible study. And that held for quite a long time. And it was interesting. We were talking with him, and he is the one in the nursing home that we went by to see. And the old fires, the embers are still down in there. Because we got to talking about something in Revelation, and he had some ideas in there, which I'm going to have to, to spend a little time researching to get back to him on, because that, there was still this desire, this desire to know what the Bible said, what it meant, and how it connected together down inside the man. He says, you know, you have you're born and have had patience. You've labored. And, of course, in our case... We, we have, um, you know, we, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. I'll just re redirect myself here. He says, You have borne, have patience, and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. You have left your first love. What I can say is that we have, there has never been a people so tempted on this matter of losing your first love as we have been in our place, in our generation, our prosperity. Our ease, our lack of opposition, 
our lack of persecution. These things tempt us. Our full bellies, our roomy homes, our shiny cars, all these things conspire to turn our hearts away from God and on to getting the grass mowed, getting the shutters painted, getting the, the gutters cleaned. And it goes on and on and on that all the things that we accumulate in life, every one of them has some requirement for maintenance from us, and they all begin to crowd other stuff out of our lives, the important things, like our first love. I hearken back a long way in the Church of God, and I remember a church of the first love, a church that was besotted of the Bible. I mean, loved the Bible, studied the Bible, talked about the Bible. We did not, we fell way short on some other aspects of Christian service, like visiting our own members who were in nursing homes. But boy, when it came to studying the Bible, we were not coming up short on that. They were a people who knew what the book said, whether they understood absolutely what it meant or not. You could make a comment about it, quote half a scripture, and they would know exactly what you were talking about and probably quote the other half of it. Nowadays, I find things that I assume people know, and I build sometimes parts of my sermon on things that I assume people know, only to find out later that it went right over their heads because they didn't. That the study of the Bible has kind of faded in our tradition compared to what it was at one time. So he could put the finger on it and say, you've left your first love, your love for the study of my word. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent, and do the first works. If you don't, I will come upon you quickly. I will remove your candlestick out of his place, except you repent. And that's the part that should scare us to death, that it is entirely possible we could lose our place among God's churches. I wouldn't like that. This you have. Again, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now then there is the one church that everybody wants to be, Philadelphia. Revelation 3, verse 7. To the church of the angel of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, because you have a little strength, and have kept my word, you have not denied my name. You know, we should always have our heads up watching for open doors and opportunities, because when it's open... We've got to get through that door before anybody has a chance to shut the door on us. That second clause in there, you have a little strength, has been interpreted. You have little strength. So I have to do all this stuff. Well, that's not really what the Greek says. It's not a negative. It's a positive. You do have a little strength. And you need to be about strengthening what you've got and making use of it. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and aren't but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, there's a conspiracy theory that makes much of the idea that the people out here who say they're Jews and society aren't, that they aren't descended from Judah at all. It's just another thinly disguised form of anti-Semitism. They are Jews and oftentimes say they are not or act like they are not. But in their, if you look back in their DNA, they really are. A lot closer to this description are those people who want to pretend to be Jewish, perhaps in their religion, in their customs, wearing the prayer shawl, wearing the yarmulke, when they have no Jewish blood in them at all and never have. These people come a lot closer to meeting this description, the Jewish wannabes. Because, he says, you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, right there is a huge incentive, if I ever heard one. If you will keep the word of my patience, I will keep you out of tribulation. 
Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no man take your crown. Get a grip, because it's possible for you to lose what you've got. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I come quickly. That was said 1,900 years ago, and we still wait. Funny thing, you know, about Bob Dylan. He said something. This is, he said this back in 1980. He said, years ago, they used to say I was a prophet. I used to say, no, I'm not a prophet. They say, yes, you are. You're a prophet. I said, no, it's not me. And they used to say, you sure are a prophet. They used to convince me I was a prophet. Now I come out and say, Jesus Christ is the answer. They say, Bob Dylan's no prophet. <laughs> they just can't handle it. End of quotation. It is the way things are. If Christ were handing out report cards, you know, if Christ were handing out report cards, did you notice not one of the seven churches got an A? Which means essentially that it doesn't make any difference where you call yourself Philadelphia or Laodicea or Sardis or you name it, call yourself what you will. You're still coming up short. You're still not getting an A. The truth of the matter is, neither would we. And in the letters to the seven churches, there are any number of important admonitions that as a church, we really need to take to heart. Not only as a church but as individuals within churches. We need to read through these letters and as we go along say to myself, what's my grade? What's my grade? What's my grade? And we need to find those things that we still have got a handle on. We need to make them stronger. Strengthen the things that remain. <laughs>